Got it. Oh, great. You saw my text? Yeah, I just got it. My goodness. What, okay. what drama. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm sharing my screen right now, and then I will stop sharing when it is your turn to go, and we should be good yeah. to go. All right. Let's get this started. So welcome, everybody. This is Stefan Tangen. Thank you for joining the first North Central 
tribal climate webinar. I recognize that some people will be joining late and some folks joined early. So we're gonna, I think, move through the agenda. And if folks join late, that's okay. So the goal of this webinar is to connect tribal managers to resources for decision-making and resource management. I'm just gonna make a quick check, make sure my audio is okay. Jordan, am I coming through you all? Yep, I can hear you. Great. I can hear you. Perfect. Uh, some housekeeping items for the call. Um, we are recording and something I found out recently is that in the chat box, if you enter information there, that also records on Zoom. Um, just so be aware of that. Um, please put yourself on mute. Uh, makes it easier, especially for feedback, so that everybody can hear. Um, if you do have something to say, obviously unmute and, and feel free to ask a question or chime in. Um, or you can use the chat box function, uh, which Jordan will be monitoring. And we'll be pasting some links into that chat box too. So if you are joining us on the webinar on your computer, you can utilize those links. Um, so again, my name is Stefan Tangen. I am a tribal resilience liaison and I work for both the Great Plains Tribal Water Alliance and the North Central Climate Adaptation Science Center. The Great Plains Tribal Water Alliance, for those of you who don't know, focuses on technical and policy issues related to water. And they do this on behalf of the Great Plains Tribal Chairman's Association. And the North Central Climate Adaptation Science Center fosters innovative and applied research in support of federal, tribal, state, and local natural resource management and decision making. And we'll post a link to the NCCASC, the North Central Climate Adaptation Science Center's website, for those of you that want to explore more resources there. And the schedule today, we're going to go through some announcements, some updates, now we've got our main speaker today is Margie Connolly, which I will introduce. And then we'll, we'll leave some time at the end for questions, probably about 10, 15 minutes. And so feel free throughout the webinar to, to post your questions in the chat box, or if you like, you can, you can save them for the very end, whichever is easiest. So currently I'm sharing my screen and it's got the North Central Climate Adaptation Science Center email that you all received as a reminder. Is that right, Jordan? Is that coming through? Yes. Perfect. Um, so now you should see the Rising Voices webpage. Rising Voices 8 is going to be starting this Friday, April 24th. Normally, Rising Voice is an in-person meeting. This Friday, they're gonna start a virtual meeting that's gonna take place over the course of several weeks. It's a great organization and resource. So feel free to explore that webpage and um, join virtually on Friday the 24th when they launch their opening ceremonies. Uh, the next thing of note, the Institute for Tribal Environmental Professionals will be facilitating a tribal hazard mitigation planning cohort for next year. The deadline to sign up for that is May 1st. And we'll provide two links, one of which I'm sharing the information, background information about it. And the second one is uh, the sign up sheet. So if you do want to get more information and are interested in joining that, you can sign up there. Um, the next announcement is about funding for responses to COVID-19. We recognize that quite a few tribal resource managers wear multiple hats and may in this time be doing emergency management duties. Um, so there's a Center for Disease Control and Prevention website here. There's resources. There's a non-competitive grant open right now for tribal public health capacity. So if that's of use to you, 
please pass that along or utilize that as you see fit. Okay, the next thing, we've got a couple conferences coming up August 31st, the National Tribal and Indigenous Climate Conference hosted by the um, Institute for Tribal Environmental Professionals, ITEP. The page there for your reference. The keynote speaker will be Winona LaDuke, and that's going to take place in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, and the last conference is the National Tribal Leadership Climate Change Summit, hosted by the affiliated tribes of Northwest Indians in Seattle, Washington, October 12 through 14. We're still planning that out. But if all goes to plan with COVID-19, we should have no issue with that conference. Um, and the last thing is this, I'm sharing this right now, but um, the link will be in the chat box, the NC CASCS website. And there's some resources for our tribal partners. Feel free to explore that. All of our webinars will be located on this page and all of our um, newsletters are currently up. So if you missed this past April's newsletter and would like to look at that you can find that on our on our web page great the next announcement is going to be given by michelle steen adams who works with the affiliated tribes of northwest indians she's working on a project that will report that will create a report to address climate change impacts to infrastructure in tribal communities. Hopefully you all can see my screen, the Congressional Report Outreach Lower 48 Report. Michelle, are you on? Okay, well, thanks so much, Stefan. And thanks everybody um, very much for making a little time um, in this meeting. Uh, I want to know, let you know about this Congressional Report efforts that is underway and I, I wanna ask for your help. Um, so my name is Michelle Steen Adams, and um, as Stefan said, I'm working with collaborators in the affiliated tribes of Northwest Indians to develop this report. Um, the requester is the Congressional Appropriations Committee, um, and as Stefan uh, introduced, the scope is a cost estimate of the unmet infrastructure needs that are due to climate change impacts. And when we, in the scope of this report, we're particularly interested in impacts that are due to erosion, um, flooding, whether that occurs um, on coasts, shorelines or rivers, and then wildfire uh, as an influence on erosion or flooding. Um, and this is a really significant report. It could influence federal to tribes for the coming decades. Um, <clears throat> we're working under a tight deadline. Uh, we have an internal deadline of May 13th. And so we're asking for a response, if at all possible, by the end of this week, or if you get any response to us by uh, after this week is okay, um, but the sooner the better. Um, <clears throat> uh, Stefan, can you advance to the next slide, please? Thanks. Okay, so um, here's how you can help. We're compiling a repository of data resources and we have very little material for the North Central region. Um, largely, we're using climate adaptation plans of specific tribes. For instance, um, the Blackfeet uh, Indian tribe uh, is a great example. Um, <clears throat> and in terms of information and documentation, we're looking for three things in particular. Um, specific tribes that are at risk of these effects of climate change impacts. Um, information about specific types of infrastructure at risk or needing protection. Um, and then cost estimates to the extent that that's available. Um, and if you're They're using our, our um, plan as an example. Sorry, Stephen? Crow Ghost is on. 
Yeah, he used to. His dad did something. I don't know if it was BIA. Keep going, or Michelle. Um, keep going. Just a reminder for everybody. Yeah, keep going. But uh, just a quick reminder to everybody to go ahead and put yourself on mute. Um, what happened to unless my you've got a, Okay. Unless you've got a question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll just finish up real quickly. So types of physical infrastructure include, say, protective infrastructure, say, um, levees or revetments that are or for shoreline hardening that's needed to protect critical infrastructure, um, transportation such as bridges, roads, airports, water and sanitation facilities, healthcare facilities, education um, facilities, residential in infrastructure, power and energy, communication, and then cultural sites, things like cemeteries and burial grounds, um, sacred cultural sites, and cultural facilities. Um, all of these things are essential to the, um, the operation of, of um, services in tribal communities. Um, <clears throat> and then in addition, we're looking for data about available resources to fulfill infrastructure needs, um, such as those of FEMA grants or EPA grants. And then finally, we're interested in contacts that you might have. Um, so if you do have information to share, our contact information is wide or, chat, or um, Stefan can send out our contact information. So um, we do hope to hear from you. Uh, if you have any documents that might help us to do just our very most thorough and complete job filing this report. Um, again, um, this report may influence um, congressional uh, decisions about tribal resources for many decades to come. So thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. So those contacts are there on my screen. You can see, you can contact Chaz Jones, Michelle, or Aaron Wharton. So at this time, does anybody have any other announcements that they would like to offer or any questions about the previous announcements? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Oh, this is Gerald Wagner with the Blackfeet Environmental Office. Um, hey, Joe. Karen Edmo's trying to get on right now, forward her the information. I tried to get on yesterday, and I apologize. I was a day early, dollar short. No worries. But um, is there um, uh, something that we can contribute um, to the request? I see that you know we, uh, you do have the Blackfeet Climate Change Plan up there as an example, but as we move into our second um, phase of the uh, plan, and that is looking at trying to get into some implementation um, uh, sectors from the plan. <clears throat> Michelle, did you want to answer that? So if I understood the question, you asked if there was additional content that you can, can send our way, is that correct? Yes. So um, additional content would be wonderful. Um, and, you know, just starting with an email dialogue, I think would be the way to go so that we can uh, best determine how the data, the materials that you might have available um, can be uh, effectively integrated into this report. So, so I'd encourage you to maybe just send um, myself or my collaborators an email and we can go from there. We would love to hear from you. How does we'll that do. sound? Okay. Sounds Remind good. Me Okay, what is your name again, please? I'm Gerald Wagner. I'm the Gerald. director of the Blackfeet Tribes um, Environmental Program, where the um, climate change grants it. I, 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 we will look forward to hearing from you, um, hopefully, maybe today even. <laughs> Thank you. 
Great, thanks, Gerald. Um, so now to our main speaker. Um, Margie Connolly is the Climate Change Program Manager for the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe. Margie has experience in both education and archaeology and has lived and worked in the Four Corners region of the United States Southwest for many years. She helped start the Climate Change Program at Ute Mountain Ute and we'll talk about her experience going through the climate adaptation planning process and developing the Ute Mountain Ute Climate Action Plan. And Margie, if you wanted to go ahead and share your slides. First of all, I wanted to say hi while I'm still a person on the screen. Um, I wanted to <laughs> say thank you to everyone for the opportunity to speak with you this morning. But most of all, my heart is out to your families and your communities, and I hope everyone is safe and healthy at this time. Now I'll pull up my PowerPoint. I don't, you guys can't see that. Stefan, why don't you pull up the one you have? No, it's up. I can see it. it. Okay, great. All right, let's go. All right, so um, Stefan asked me to, to kind of share the story of how we developed and created our climate adaptation plan. I would like to say this has been quite a long process. It's taken us at least three years to get to this point. It has been a community effort. I'm kind of a person who's put things together, but it worked with our elders, with our tribal leadership, community members, and we're very fortunate that we got to work with uh, Dr. Shannon McNeely from CSU. She's the person who we relied on for, the expert, uh, for our expertise. Is this working? Can you guys see that? The second slide? Looks good to me. Okay, so the second slide is of um, our reservation, the Ute Mountain Ute Tribal Lands. We're located in southwestern Colorado uh, in a place where they call the Four Corners, where the Four Corners states come together. So you have Colorado, Utah, New Mexico, and Arizona. The shaded portion of the slide is the Ute Mountain Ute Reservation. We have about 600,000 acres a little bit dips into New Mexico, and then some over into uh, southeastern Utah. Uh, the main community for our, our tribe is Toyak. It's about 2,000 people, and we have another town over in southeastern Utah called White Mesa with about 300 residents. The area is uh, really beautiful here. We have gorgeous mountains and canyons and a lot of upland sagebrush. So Stefan asked me to address this question, um, like why, why do you start a climate change program? Why did the tribe initiate something like this? And, and it really came from the elders. They were asking the natural resource managers questions like, what happened to winter? And how come it doesn't snow like it used to when we were kids? And community members were also observing, you know, the temperatures were changing. Things were getting a lot hotter. There were more long-term droughts and changes in seasons. Um, you're probably experiencing this in your community too, but winter doesn't come, snow doesn't come like it used to. It used to come by Halloween. We don't, we get a lot more rain than we used to and, and a lot less snow up into the mountains. And our, a lot of people who make their livelihood from the tribe, they actually have a lot of farming and ranching, and our ranch lands are really getting hammered through drought and increasing invasive species. Margie? Yes? If you want to make your screen bigger, you can go into presentation mode. Thank you. I didn't know it wasn't working that way. Thanks. Perfect. That, that's handy. Yep. <laughs> okay, so I guess I should, I just wanted to start at the basic level, because when I, I came into this, there's a lot of vocabulary that I don't think I understood. 
and you know really what is a climate adaptation plan it's just a process to begin planning for the climate changes that are already underway it's a way that you can work with your community to identify and analyze and select adaptation measures. And you saw in Michelle's slide, there are a lot of climate adaptation plans that have already been done. There's probably at least 70 of them, lots of good examples out here. There are three reasons why I think um, we really went for climate adaptation plan. First was the elders, the second was what we were hearing from climate scientists. And the third is once you finish a climate adaptation plan, you are a lot more desirable for funding and when you get to the implementation st stage. So I'm assuming most of you guys can read this, but if you're not online, the, the top of it, what our elders are saying is summer is too hot. It's just too hot now. So this is a quote by one of our elders. The old people went by the weather. The climate has really changed. You expect heat in the winter. Um, I have to move my thing here, sorry. And that's how I grew up. Winter was long back then. The snow longer comes, no longer comes in October. Sometimes we don't have snow in December. It used to snow in April. A long time ago, it used to rain a lot and we played in the mud. The frogs would come, come out of nowhere. We don't see that rain anymore. And I took the next quote from our climate action plan. The climate in this region has warmed two degrees Fahrenheit in the last century. By the middle of the century, the region is expected to warm an additional three to eight degrees Fahrenheit. Climate change is expected to worsen impacts and increase risk to our people and natural environment in this region. Ute Mountain Ute people depend on natural resources to maintain our cultural practices, identity, and sovereignty as a people. These warmer temperatures have caused reduced precipitation, changes in seasonality, and health concerns such as asthma, cardi cardiovascular disease, among other things. So how does someone get started on the climate adaptation plan? First of all, you have Stefan as your resource and the people at uh, the North Central Climate Adaptation Science Center. They're wonderful. I've worked with them throughout our plan, they're, they're swell, they're really great people. So I would work with Stefan, and then these are the four web pages that I thought were important to get started. First, the Institute of Environmental Professionals Climate Change page. I attended one of their adaptation planning workshops. It was really helpful. I think many of you are already familiar with the National Climate Assessment. It's done by Congress every four years or mandated by Congress every four years. And the last climate assessment, they were able to get a chapter in on tribes and indigenous people. This one that was just published, chapter 15, is really an excellent resource and, um, and it's beautifully done. It's really a well-written well document. If you're looking for other tribes climate adaptation plans, you can find them on ITEP's webpage, and you can also find them on the University of Oregon webpage. And for our planning process, we used um, what's called the Tribal Climate Adaptation Guidebook Framework, and I also listed that webpage there for you. All right, so this image here comes from the Tribal Climate Adaptation Guidebook Framework. This is how we did our climate planning. The first thing we did is we centered the tribe's adaptation effort. Then we went and talked to community members and tried to understand what their concerns were about the changing climate. I'll talk about how we assessed our vulnerability in a few minutes. Then we did actually the climate planning and then the final step is what we're moving into now. We're moving into how do you implement these actions and how do you find the money to do that? <laughs> yes, that is the challenge. <laughs> all right, so step one, th these steps all happened before I, I took the position because I hadn't created the position yet. Our tribal chairman, Manuel Hart, was very concerned about climate change. So it was pretty easy to get a tribal council resolution for the environmental programs department to work on climate change. We formed partnerships with Colorado State University, as I mentioned um, before, with Dr. Shannon McNeely, 
And we also have our own natural resource interdisciplinary team. So we worked with them too. Our funding came from the BIA Tribal Resilience Program, but there is also funding for climate change out of the Bureau of Rec Reclamation Climate Smart Program. Here in where I live in the Mancus Valley, they have money for climate change planning from that and from local agencies. So through all that, they received the funding and then they actually established a formal office and that's how I got hired. Okay. Uh, step two, as I mentioned, is to identify the concerns in your community. And then we did the vulnerability assessment. Uh, we are almost done with our climate action plan. It does need to have tribal council approval. And then, we're, and then the, probably the hardest step is going to be trying to find money for the actions that you identify. So our community-based vulner vulnerability assessment. So I was confused by all this vocabulary when I first started. So what is a vulnerability assessment? It's the process of identifying risks within your community and providing the tribe with the necessary knowledge to understand the threats that are there. So working with Shannon, we developed an interview question list and worked with our elders committee and we went out and we interviewed with a translator, with Helen, who is the head of our language and culture department. And we interviewed 27 community members, six natural resource managers. And the questions were like about how has the landscape changed over time? How has the weather changed? Um, what impacts do you see out on the landscape? And then to our natural resource managers, we ask the same questions, but we also ask them about their current management practices and what barriers are they experienced to even talking about climate change with their departments and the people that work under them. All right, so from the vulnerability assessment, I just picked three things to discuss. There was a lot more information, but I thought, this would be of interest to people. The first thing, because we do live in the high desert here in the Southwest in the Four Corners, the number one concern really is reduced water quantity and quality. And this is a, a quote that you can probably see up in your screen from one of our elders, but I'll read it in case you don't have a screen. Um, the main geographic feature on the Ute Mountain Ute Reservation is the Ute Mountain. It's a beautiful landscape. And up there is where the ceremonies occur, where our springs are, where the lakes are. So this is what the elders said. Our mountain, Ute Mountain, used to have water everywhere, springs everywhere. There's no water up in the mountain. We used to have lakes and ponds for the animals, and now they're dry up on the mountain. This is probably being determined by the climate and some diversions that are happening upstream, and also we just having a lot more dry washes and arroyos around this country right now. Another thing I pulled out that I thought might be of interest to you is just the, the cultural activities, how things have changed, looking at when people are going out collecting, they're fine. This is a list on the right hand side where we identified all the different plants that people mentioned throughout the 33 interviews and we um, tabulated that. So the number one concern from this chart, if you can see it on the right, is that people were concerned about the changes in abundance and distribution of the plants. So there are less cottonwoods and willows for people to collect and also a lot less things like acorns and pine nuts. And what's happening here is that people have to go north. They have to go off of tribal lands to co collect their culturally important plants. And that's a real difference in elders' lifestyle. And when I was trying to figure out what years that really started happening, it probably started in the 1970s, but people really had to go out and ask local landowners for permission in the 1990s. There's also been a change in our wildlife. 
Uh, here's another quote from an elder I've seen there, referring to the deer and elk. Their build, you know, the growth of their bodies and things like that have changed. The vegetation has a lot to do with it. So we're seeing impacts to the grasslands, the invasive species are really prominent in the southern portion of the reservation. We're having a decline in deer and elk. We're just trying to get, we just started about a wildlife department, so we're trying to get a handle on that, see what numbers are out there. Definitely people over in Utah think that, that the deer and elk are, that they're seeing are less healthy and there's more wildlife disease and changes to the body fat. Uh, fish are pretty much gone from here, except very small fish, not fish that people can eat anymore. And then during times of drought or fire, we're seeing the bear and the mountain lion coming down into the community um, around people's homes. And that really never happened before until probably the last 10 years. Okay, so the socioeconomic impacts, and this is bear dance. I should have mentioned that at the beginning of the slide. Bear dance is one of the most important cultural activities. It occurs every June here, and it celebrates when the bear comes out of the mountain. So the impacts that we're seeing is that the elders are spending less time outside. Um, a lot of the air conditioning systems aren't working all that great, so they're, the elders are pretty hot. And what, how this impacts is that some of the elders just don't want to come out in the hot sun like you can see bear dance now. People have a lot more umbrellas, a lot more shade, or they might not show up for the dance until later in the day when it's a bit cooler. We're seeing an increase in respiratory conditions down here, the air quality, a little bit of increase in ozone. Uh, people are complaining about allergies like they never had before. And the economic impacts, of course, are higher electric bills. We're seeing people having to spend more money for produce during drought. And recreation impacts, as I mentioned before, people just, aren't re people just really are not going outside like they used to. All right, so then we took the results of this vulnerability assessment. That's the whole point in doing this. And we gave it back to the community um, with Shannon and Tyler, her assistant's help. They made summary of findings, these two page fact sheets that are easy to read that we gave to um, our tribal council, back to the elder committee and other people in the community and the natural resource managers. So this was really an important step, I think, in climate adaptation planning because it built support with all these people too. So we were able to get community buy-in for the next step, which was to actually create the plan. So the first step in that is we, we went to tribal council and we got a resolution for our climate change adaptation plan. And this is a picture of one of our kids during our science camp here on the right. Um, then we were able to get funding again from the BIA Tribal Resilience Program and we were able to secure expertise from Shannon again. So that was really helpful because she helped with the grant writing too. And then we established a climate change adaptation planning working group. And that's what I would really recommend that you guys do if you have not done this, you need to get people together. So it was handy that we had done the vulnerability assessment and Helen and I had interviewed so many natural resource managers because they came on board with us when we wanted to create this working group. We also brought in people from the BIA agency, especially BIA Fire and BIA Range. And we um, have a tribal council member who's on this working group too. Very important part of this process. Took a lot of work, um, a lot of challenges to get everyone together and committed to doing the climate action plan. So from that, we identified that the most important thing that this plan can address is the human health and livelihoods of the Ute Mountain Ute tribal community members. So our plan focuses clearly around how can we make the environment 
safer and healthier for people in the face of a warming climate. So we took the vulnerability assessment and, and kind of narrowed it down with the, the adaptation planning group and came up with these, these were our priority areas. There are different ways to do an adaptation plan. We focused ours, ours is very broad. If you take the time to review other plans, you'll see that other tribes might focus completely on wildlife or on water, but we chose to do a broader approach and probably in the future we'll kind of go down and work specifically on some of these other initiatives. So we came down with our priority planning areas were human health, livelihood, tourism, agriculture and food security, air quality, water resources, riparian water and wetlands systems, rangelands, forest health, terrestrial and aquatic wildlife and energy. It was ambitious. I mean, this is a lot to work through, but I think it was what the community was asking us to do. Another thing that um, Dr. McNeely suggested and, and provided a lot of information for us is that we went and looked and found every plan that had ever been written by the tribe. Okay, so we looked at you know, our cultural resource management plan, our water quality plans, the hazard mitigation plans. We looked at all of those to see what are people already doing and to help with climate change. And we found that there is a, a lot that's happening within our community. So I would recommend that you guys do that too, because sometimes this can seem a little daunting, but you're already doing a lot of things that are helping the land and the people, and it's good to identify it for your community members and for your leadership. Um, we have some fun projects that I think we're, we're pretty proud of. Most um, recently, we just turned on a one megawatt, one megawatt community solar scale farm. And the purpose of this farm is to bring down the energy costs for uh, community members. That just got launched in February. We have a lot of projects that we're doing with other people um, around, because a lot of our water comes from the Dolores River and the Mancus River, so we work with those water conservancy districts. And because we are in such a dry, environment a lot of work is being done right now on adjudicating water rights our water rights are adjudicated in colorado but they're not done yet in new mexico and utah and we have a 7,000 acre farm and ranch enterprise and they have done a lot of work improving the irrigation systems to make them more drought tolerant so i think you too will find if you take the time Assistant Tyler did this work. They took all these plans and they, they looked at them and came up with lots of good things that were already happening. Sorry. Okay. So what we then did with all those uh, planning areas that identified is we went ahead and we set adaptation goals for each of them. And then we created spreadsheets to prioritize how we were gonna come up with all this. There's so much work to be done. I'm sure you guys all feel that. There's so much work to be done, so many little limited resources. So we took this sheet that you can see, I hope you can see, it was an example from the Tohono O'odham Climate Action Plan. We modified it for our needs. I brought out one example for you so I can show you how we actually took all this information and tried to put it into digestible charts for the community. So this one represents our water quantity planning area. And we, what we did is we identified the observed changes that we're seeing with water, the potential impacts that this is to the community, the consequences of change, and then we had so many adaptation actions, we actually prioritized them into near term, what we can do in the next one to three years, what we can do, we call that medium, in the next three to 10 years, 
and what really are our long-term goals for water quantity. And then we listed all the possible partners and funding sources that we could do for water quantity. And we did this for um, each of the 13 planning areas that we identified. And this was the bulk of the work of the climate plan. And this is probably what people will be referring to in the next five years. Are these planning area worksheets? What can we do now? What are we already doing? You know, what, what is our future planning? So this works for us. You know, every climate plan you'll see as you go through it has wonderful attributes to it, wonderful things that people are doing, but this was the, the best way we found to consolidate our information. Okay. So action eight was completing our plan. And I should say that we did not call our plan a climate adaptation plan. People in our community felt that climate action plan was more direct. So we changed the name of our, our plan in one of our first meetings. So this is what it's gonna look like. And what you're seeing in the foreground, that is the Ute Mountain, the most important landmark to the Ute people. As I mentioned earlier, this still has to go in front of tribal council. And obviously the tribe is closed right now. It's been approved by our Climate Action Working Group. It's my intention when we open up again to you know, bring this to the tribal leadership. I'm assuming it will get approved and then we will have the opportunity to share it with other people because I, I and the group, we learned so much by looking at other climate adaptation plans and I would like to have the opportunity to share this with all of you and with our community. Okay, and so here I am. I'm Margie. You can ask me questions anytime. You can, that's my email address. I'd happy to share, you know, some of the things that were hard about doing this, some of the successes, whatever questions you guys might have now, or that Stefan, how he wants to end this up. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you for your atten attention. And I really hope everything goes well in your communities here. Our tribe, we, we don't have any confirmed cases of COVID-19. We've had two people die in our county, which and we've only had 13 cases in our county. Um, our big concern here is we border the Navajo Reservation and it's one of the hot spots right now. And so we, there's a lot of prayers going on in our, out here and I hope we can just have a communal prayer among all of us in this group for, for everyone that's being affected. So thank you. Thank you so much, Margie, for presenting. Uh, if you have a question, please feel free to type it in the chat box, or you can also ask it out loud, particularly if you're on the phone. I haven't seen any questions in the Ask chat away box. if you're yeah. still awake. <laughs> and I did have to mute a couple people because of the audio issues that we were getting some feedback. So if you're muted, okay. that may be part of it. But um, I have a question, and this is something that we talked about a little bit, Margie. What do you think were the things that um, helped you be successful? Some of the like real notable things. I think that the community was already seeing the changes. So I think there was already community acceptance of climate change. I think the leadership helping us was huge. Um, getting our partnership with CSU and at that time the Climate Adaptation Center, working with uh, climate scientists. I think Imtiaz might be on this. He was very helpful too. Uh, Shannon McNeely. I think you have to go out and find expertise. And I think just a willing for the Climate Action Working Group to come together. So 
it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy to do this. It's, it, it took a long time and it, it's, it's process work, it's group work. But I think kind of the slower you go and you actually do the steps that are identified in the tribal um, handbook, it's really worth taking the time because you get so much more input if you can go out there and listen to what people are seeing on the landscape. Great, thank you. It looks like we have a few questions that just came through. Okay. The first one, what federal resources have been most useful in your planning? Oh, by far the BIA Tribal Resilience Program because they gave us the money. So that's where the funding came from. Uh, I mentioned the different climate centers. We have our own, we have a lot of federal land around us. So we have Mesa Verde National Park. So looking at what the park service has done in this area, the forest service, BIA fire has been particularly helpful. The climate centers, and then reading, 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 because honestly, I did not understand the terminology, the processes, you know, you just have to put a lot of time into talking to people and reading. And I think I mentioned, I think when we go into implementation, we're seeing some hope that we might be, get, be able to get some funding from the Bureau of Reclamation, their, their Water Smart program. That requires, I think, 50% matching. So that's going to be a little challenging for our tribe right now because we're devastated with money right now. There's the casinos closed, the hotels closed, you know, matching funds could be, you know, but there, there are federal funds out there if you go look. Great, thank you. Uh, look, the next one here. Do the Ute Mountain Utes have a method for determining adaptability of cultural heritage resources, such as ancient archaeological sites? Well, yes. I mean, we have, a, I'm not sure this is the answer. We do have a TIPO office, so a Tribal Historic Preservation Office. They have a cultural resource management plan. We, for those of you who've never been down here, um, the southern part, or, the, or that would be the northern part of the reservation actually is the southern boundary of Mesa Verde National Park and we have spectacular cultural resources that belong to the ancestral Pueblo people and are identified with with modern day Pueblo people and there are youth sites um, among that. So we are seeing climate change impact on the cultural resources especially through fire uh, fire around the cliff dwellings and then the ash coming washing off kind of going over the overhangs and being problematic for the trails and also for the cultural resources did that answer the question i think so yeah we have a couple more here too okay. and if anyone has um wants to follow up uh with some of these questions or want to ask margie directly her emails on the screen there. Um, the next one says, could you talk a little bit about how you framed the issue to your tribal council in order to raise this as a priority? Or what were your main talking points that resonated with them? I was not there for the first presentation. Um, as I, I mentioned, our um, current chairman Hart, he was very supportive of this when he heard about it. When I made the presentation f to get the funding to actually do the plan, I, I identified almost the same things I did for you in this presentation. I talked about what the elders were seeing on the landscape, how the vulnerability assessment identified the risks that, were, that, we, were going, that we were experiencing and what we would experience in the future. There was really no pushback in this project, I didn't feel, and there were no climate deniers that I came across. So I would say we had really good support. I think our tribal council wanted to make sure that the elders' interviews would be preserved, that the information would not be shared outside the community. 
which was a little hard on Dr. McNeely and CSU because they weren't allowed to use this information for, you know, for their academic papers. And so that was the big contribution that Shannon made because she wasn't able to get probably what she needed academically from this project. So I think our tribal council, once they knew it was gonna be an in-house project, the elder committee was in support of it, the natural resource managers, it was, they were pretty easy talking points and that the money would not come out of the tribal budget, you know, that we were getting money from the outside. Great, thank you. Next question. How did you determine what resource managers to contact and include? Was everyone included or specific managers? Well, I would say we're probably a very underfunded tribe when it comes to that. So that was pretty easy. Um, we have a natural resource department and what they call environmental programs department. So we included all the managers in the environmental program department. So that was the air quality manager, the water manager, um, and then the natural resource, we brought in the range people from BIA, we brought in fire, we brought in more range people. So all together, there's probably less than a dozen people that are working in natural and environmental resources for the tribe. So it wasn't that hard to bring them together. There were some that didn't want to come to meetings and I would go around and do this individually. And when we actually did the spreadsheets um, where we were identifying and prioritizing our planning areas, we did two half day workshops with Shannon. And some people, you know, did came, some didn't, some had other meetings. So part of that was also going out and doing individual work and working with people's personalities because some people really don't like group work. So, so I just went and worked with them by myself. And I, I think that's a really good point. After visiting you in Toyok, it became very apparent that you would work directly with folks and were well-versed in um, where people were located and their offices and how to get through to them. And I think that's a, a key point when you're trying to get uh, people to um, participate is that direct interaction. Sometimes people don't respond to emails. So that's a, I, I think that's a really good question, really good answer. Couple more questions for you. How would you recommend that federal land managers work with tribes for climate action for those lands? That might be a little bigger than my scope. Um, we, once again, we have good connections here. How would I, we work, once again, individually, I would probably, take your concerns and and go to them you know go to like the forest service office go to the park service office we have a good relationship with our natural resource conservation service but i think if you really want a relationship you probably need to identify your concerns and go to the federal land managers because they just get too many emails i think we share watersheds here, like I think many of you do, and you need to probably go to them and try to figure out if you can get them to be involved in a meeting. I would think that that is something that Stefan could do, and part of his job is helping to coordinate those relationships. The North Central Climate Adaptation Science Center has a joint advisory steering committee and there are federal managers that are on that steering committee. And so I think hooking up with that organization, they might, there's some really good people on that steering committee and, and they really do want to work and work with tribes. So I think that would be a good place to start. Thanks. Yeah, that's a good answer. And I think that's a good point for um, tribal managers that they, they could reach out to uh, federal agencies. I think this question was also 
saying what your recommendations were for federal land managers in order to reach out to tribes. Um, do you have any suggestion on how the federal land managers should do that? Well, they don't do it very well, let's face it. And the <laughs> meetings I go to are so lame. And um, I, because we have mechanisms at the Ute Tribe, like we have a monthly meeting with our natural resource and environmental land managers, we encourage them to come to those meetings at least twice a year and give us updates on what's going on in their area. So we have that mechanism and we also encourage them to give presentations to our tribal council. Great, yeah. And I appreciate I, I think, you plugging me there because oh, I'm happy to be a resource. I'm, I'm connected to quite a few federal agencies and know a lot of folks. So I'm always happy to also provide that connection both for I, the federal resource managers and the federal managers. And I kind of watch this interaction because you can see that people, when they, they first come to the tribe and to their, these meetings, they're, they're kind of intimidated because they've never done anything like this before. But like in anything, the more you build a relationship, the better it is. And I would also encourage maybe a field trip. We have done at least one field trip with our local agencies here where we followed the Mancus River from the watershed um, that goes really from the mountains all the way down to the San Juan River. And we had federal land managers, local farmers and, and ranchers. So if you can put together some kind of field trip, I think that really relaxes people and creates informal relationships. Yeah, that's a good point. And I, we got one more question that I wanna get in before we hit the hour mark. Um, this person would like to hear more about the solar farm and what that looked like as far as community involvement, successes, and or challenges. Oh, yeah. Um, I don't know if people get the Star Magazine. That's the air quality one. Janice has just written a thing about the solar farm. But in sum, it was a collaborative effort with the Department of Energy. They are... Um, really looking to work on tr help people create solar farms on tribal lands. Ours was um, a one megawatt one. And the first time they went for the grant, they didn't get it. Second time we got it because we um, uh, worked with a nonprofit. And I can, I can send this out to you like an article about it, but we worked with a nonprofit to actually help us build it. And then we've worked with our local electrical company so what's happening to community members now when they get their electric bills, it actually says on it, Ute Mountain Ute Solar Credit. It was a $2 million project. About $800,000 of that came from the Department of Energy and the rest came from the tribe, from some Land, some monies that were put aside for big projects in the future. It was a federal requirement that if we the tribe used this money, they had to use it for projects that would benefit the whole community. And we just applied for one to, to put in a solar facility at our sister village out in White Mesa, Utah. Great. Thank you so much. Those are all the questions that I see. Um, also, if you are interested in learning more, again, Margie's email contact is there on the screen, and I'm also happy to patch you through, so um, you can't get through to Margie because of email situation due to working from home or something, let me know and I can also connect you. Um, if you would like to get more information and are not yet signed up for the newsletter, um, please do so. You can do that on the website. There's a link on the bottom right uh, or connect with me directly. Uh, we're going to be hosting another webinar on May 20th at 10 a.m. So generally the third Wednesday of each month at 10 a.m. If you have suggestions, feedback, anything like that, please feel free to reach out to me. And 
yeah, you will be receiving a, a feedback form and we would love to hear from you directly. So once you get that form, feel free to uh, fill that out. Margie, thank you so much. All right, thank for you for the opportunity. Okay, okay take care and stay everybody. healthy, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, everybody stay safe, stay healthy, and we look forward to seeing you next month.